Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 835 for September 6th, 2020. Coming up in a few minutes. Nerdy booze enthusiasts like me go out on December 5th every year on repeal day and, and raise our, our glasses uh, at the bar back when we could go to bars uh, and, and kind of celebrate repeal day. Um, but, but really when repeal day happened, it, it basically meant that the federal government got out of the business of regulating alcohol and there was kind of this void and into the void step states and local governments. Over the years, we've done an occasional feature called the Red Tape Follies, highlighting some of the strange laws or bureaucratic decisions that not only make you want to shake your head, but maybe even pour yourself a stiff drink. Jarrett Dieterle of the R Street Institute think tank in Washington has taken the Red Tape Follies to a higher level. His new book, Give Me Liberty and Give Me a Drink, takes some of those laws and pairs them with an appropriate cocktail. He'll join me later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. I'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department behind the label, September's Whiskey Club of the Month announcement, and... We are an industry that's been driven for, gosh, decades, if not longer, by white men. Uh, we barely scratched the surface on women in our industry. The news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. We'll begin with some job shuffling within the whiskey industry. Jeff Arnett shocked Jack Daniels fans, and probably a few of his colleagues, with his sudden announcement Thursday that he is stepping down as master distiller at the end of the month. That's because he's the first in a long line of master distillers, going back to Jack Daniel himself, who has ever stepped down for another position instead of retiring. We don't know yet what that new gig is, Jeff declined our request for an interview this week out of respect for his colleagues at Jack Daniels, but he did confirm it was his decision to leave, and he is not leaving the whiskey industry. He's been at Jack Daniels since 2001 and was named Master Distiller in 2008 after Jimmy Bedford retired. Jeff's replacement has not been named. That's expected in the coming weeks. And the likely candidate for the job is Chris Fletcher, who has been Jeff Arnett's assistant for the last six years. In addition to having another big factor in his favor, he is also the grandson of the late Frank Bobo, who was the master distiller for Jack Daniels from 1966 until 1988. Turning now to Scotland, we reported several weeks ago that Colin Gordon is leaving Diageo's Lagavulin distillery on Isla to move down the road and take over as manager when Mickey Heads retires at Ardbeg next month. That has resulted in a shuffle of managers within the Diageo production team on Isla. Pierre Guillaume will be moving over from Kalila to Lagavulin, while Port Ellen Malting's manager Samuel Hale will replace Guillaume at Kalila. No word yet on who will take over at the Maltings. One other job change to note, this one out of Pernod Ricard. Former Irish Distillers CEO Anna Malmiochi has left the company. JustDrinks.com reported this week that she left the company for a new position in the tech industry based in London. Malmiochi led Irish Distillers from 2011 through 2016, when Pernod Ricard moved her back to her native Sweden to become CEO of the Absolute Company. During her time in Dublin, she helped lead the multi-million dollar expansion at Middleton Distillery. Meanwhile, Pernod Ricard released its fiscal year 2020 financial results Wednesday. Sales and profits fell sharply worldwide for the year, though it was a tale of two halves. The first half of the year showed strong growth worldwide, but the pandemic decimated results during the second half of the year, as bars and restaurants around the world were forced to close down for months. 
CEO Alexander Ricard told reporters and analysts in Paris that the coming year would bring continued uncertainty and volatility because of the coronavirus pandemic. On top of that, the company also took a hit because of the U.S. tariffs on single malt scotch whiskeys. Pernod Ricard's Chivas Brothers division is the number two producer of scotch whiskeys. Overall, its scotch sales dropped by 11% worldwide, but North America was one of only two regions showing an increase in sales over the previous year. Sales were up by 16% between last July and December, that first half, second half story I mentioned, but the combination of tariffs and the pandemic knocked that down to just a 3% gain for the entire year. Chevis Brothers CEO Jean-Christophe Coutures told reporters on the company's Zoom call that a strong performance by the Glen Levitt gets a lot of the credit for salvaging the year. It's extremely difficult today to assess the different impact because we had so much happening in the U.S. Uh, we know that there was a tariff increase. Uh, there was as well uh, the on-premise business, which was closed down uh, from March, April. Uh, we had the off-trade business being impacted. Uh, so there are a lot of effects. What we do know on the Shiva's brother is that the Glenlivet has been gross on a full year basis in growth at the end of December. And the question is, are, is it possible that we have been so resilient despite everything which is, has been impacting us in the US? I think the first answer to that is our portfolio. I think we have quite a unique portfolio in the world of malt. Uh, we have uh, an entry level uh, a proposition with founders reserve, which is aiming at recruiting new drinkers into the category. New drinkers which are coming from super premium whiskey, but as well new drinkers which are coming from other categories. And then we know that there is the high end of the portfolio, which is the 12, the 15, and the 18. If you look at the performance of each part of our portfolio, we can see that the high end part of our portfolio have been suffering a lot more on the back of price increase subsequent to the tariff increase. And this part of the business has been suffering, and it's very clearly linked to the tariff increase in the U.S. But it's been more than compensating by all the recruitment effort that we've been doing, by uh, driving very hard funders reserve, and as well introducing the Caribbean rum at the back of the fiscal year. So overall, I think our portfolio put us in a very strong and good situation. But back to your question, I could only echo the critical importance for single malt to see those tariffs removed in the U.S. because what makes our category absolutely unique is that we have brands like Glenlivet, but we have as well a lot of small brands which come, in fact, from uh, small distillers in, in, in Scotland and make the richness of, of this category in the U.S., and today we know a lot of those small players are suffering to see very strong traction in the U.S. And we do think that if we want single malt as a category to continue its momentum, it will be very important that not only the large brands like Glenlivet grow, but as well all those small distilleries, which are very small and niche brands, continue to outperform the market. Otherwise consumer could see single malt at any a, another category which has been dominated and hijacked by large brands. I think it's very, very important that we keep the richness of this category. And moving forward, I do think that the future of this category is very much relying as well in the U.S. on the removal of tariff. Couture's mentioned the Glenlivet Caribbean Reserve, which made its debut in the U.S. this spring, it is now being released in the U.K. as of this week. The company will also invest £2.5 million, about $3.3 million, to upgrade the visitors' center at the Glenlivet over the coming year and will continue to develop new whiskies. That includes a new Ballantine's 7-year-old bourbon finish that will debut later this month in select markets along with a global rollout for the Chivas Regal Extra 13 collection and the return of the Glenlivet's Capsule Collection, available whiskey-filled pods 
that created a stir at last year's London Cocktail Week. Other new whiskey announcements this week. Tam Dew is out with the fifth release of its Batch Strength Single Malt. It's bottled at 59.8% ABV and will be available in select markets for around 80 pounds, about $106 a bottle. Hunter Lang & Company will be releasing a new line of its Hepburn's Choice range of single-cask bottlings later this month, complete with new packaging. The updated range includes 9-year-old Ben Nevis and Kalila malts, an 11-year-old Jura, and a 12-year-old Glenbergie. And if you've ever wondered who the Hepburn is in Hepburn's Choice, it's named for William Hepburn, Stuart Lang's late father-in-law, who served in Great Britain's diplomatic service for many years. It seems like just yesterday that we were talking about the spring 2020 release of Heaven Hill's Old Fitzgerald Bottled in Bond. Okay, it was in late July, but the fall release is now on its way. This edition is a 14-year-old Bottled in Bond bourbon distilled during the fall season of 2005. Observant bourbon lovers may remember a previous 14-year-old Old Fitzgerald bottled in Bond that was bottled with a red label. That one was only sold at the Bourbon Heritage Center in Bardstown and a handful of Kentucky retailers and carried a red label. This release comes from different warehouses and, of course, a different production season. It'll be available in limited amounts for around $140 a bottle. Buffalo Trace is bringing yet another version of Blanton's bourbon to the U.S. for the first time. Blanton's Straight from the Barrel will be an annual fall release, joining this summer's U.S. release of Blanton's Gold. Both were previously available only outside the United States. Blanton's Straight from the Barrel is uncut and unfiltered, and if you can find it, The recommended retail price will be $150 a bottle. Rabbit Hole is releasing its oldest whiskey yet, the six-year-old Boxer Grail Founders Collection Kentucky Straight Rye. Founder Kava Zamanian picked seven specific barrels to create the whiskey from among the first he laid down six years ago. 1,315 bottles will be available starting next month, with a recommended retail price of $195 each. In other news, we reported earlier this summer that the Kentucky Distillers Association planned to set up scholarships to support minority students studying in distillation programs at the state's universities. The first scholarships to be funded by the KDA's Lifting Spirits Foundation will fund full tuition for four students each year, in the University of Kentucky's Distillation, Wine, and Brewing Studies program, which includes the Beam Institute for Kentucky Spirits. The scholarships are starting with this fall's semester at UK, and KDA President Eric Gregory expects to have similar deals in place with other Kentucky schools soon. There are a few two voices uh, in our industry, a few two black voices, LGBTQIA, uh, people of color, you name it. Um, we are an industry that's been driven uh, for, gosh, decades, if not longer, by white men. Uh, we barely scratched the surface on women in our industry. So we need to build an industry that's more reflective of our culture and population and uh, getting people in in diverse uh, areas as early in the distillation programs that we can uh, to us is a good place to start. Um, and it's not just the scholarships that we're looking at. Um, as Jessica Pendergrass, our chairwoman, uh, who's really been helping lead this effort, uh, mentioned in the news release, uh, we're looking at internship opportunities and a lot of other ways that we can uh, have this group really bond uh, and uh, form this KDA scholars group that can uh, start to really integrate within our industry and also uh, champion each other. And um, I think that's one thing that's special about Kentucky Bourbon that we pride ourselves on camaraderie and friendship and uh, the distilleries work together, and we want these UK scholars and other scholars to do the same thing. The KDA's board has also started meeting with a new advisory panel that includes the founders of Black-Owned Bro Brothers Distillery in Louisville and the Fresh Distilling Company in Lexington, along with members of the state's LGBTQIA community and other minority groups. 
The overall goal is to increase diversity within the industry. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. Our live webcasts return this week after a short break during August. My guests on this week's Whiskey Wednesday webcast, Garrett Oliver, who is the brewmaster at Brooklyn Brewery in New York City. He's created the Michael Jackson Foundation for Brewing and Distilling, which will also fund scholarships for people of color studying to become brewers and distillers. Jane Bowie, the Director of Innovation at Maker's Mark, will also join us. She's responsible for the Wood Finishing Series and their other experimental whiskeys. On our Friday night happy hour show, I'll be joined by a bunch of brand ambassadors who have had to spend more time at home the last few months than they probably have over the last several years combined. Tish Harkis of Canadian Club, Colin Dunn of Diageo's Classic Malts, Sailor Guevara of Uncle Nearest, and David Blackmore of the Glenmorangie and Ardbeg will all be on hand. We'll talk about travel stories from the road and take your questions too. Our webcasts start at 5 p.m. New York time on Wednesdays and Fridays on the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Twitter, and Periscope. Time now for the calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. We do have a few more event changes this week because of the pandemic. While Whiskey and Barrel Night will still take place outdoors in Paramus, New Jersey on September 16th, the Whiskey and Barrel Night events planned for October in Chicago and Los Angeles have now been postponed with no new dates announced yet. In addition, the Indie Spirits Expo planned for next month in Chicago is also being canceled. Registration is now open for the virtual version of Tales of the Cocktail, It'll run September 21st through the 24th. McTeers has its next whiskey auction in Glasgow, Scotland on the 25th. The virtual version of The Whiskey Show will take place online October 2nd through the 9th. The Spirit of Toronto's virtual tastings will take place online throughout the entire month of October. As of now, Whiskey Live in Warsaw, Poland is still scheduled for October 2nd and 3rd. Bonhams has a whiskey auction in Edinburgh, Scotland on the 7th of October, and the Virtual Whiskey Colors Festival, sponsored by the whiskey shop Dufton, will be online October 8th through the 12th. And as of now, the Hong Kong Whiskey Festival is still on for October 11th. Of course, all of the in-person events I've mentioned are subject to change on very short notice, depending on local health restrictions. So please make sure you double check with event organizers before you make any travel plans. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of Virginia's most awarded spirits. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states, three continents, and worldwide online. Visit the Where to Buy page at CatoctinCreekDistilling.com to find a retailer near you. And please drink responsibly. The search never ends, but it's nice when you can come in for a landing, pause and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey, matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. There's no shortage of, shall we say, unusual laws and regulations surrounding not only whiskey, but pretty much beverage alcohol of all types around the world. The patchwork of laws and regulations from country to country, let alone state to state, is so jumbled that even the industry trade associations that are supposed to keep track of these things for their members have trouble keeping up because the rules keep changing all the time. For instance, the coronavirus pandemic and lockdowns of distillery tasting rooms in many areas prompted a few U.S. states to legalize cocktails to go and direct-to-consumer in-state shipping by executive order. 
and those privileges could very well disappear with no notice once the executive orders expire. Then there are those rules that make you just want to shake your head. Of course, I've closed every episode of Whiskey Cast with a reference to our hometown, the charming yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. It's dry because New Jersey has traditionally allowed local governments to decide for themselves whether to allow alcohol sales at all. And that leads to situations like this example. There's a bar and restaurant within walking distance of our house where the town border runs through the property. The parking lot is in Haddonfield, while the building itself is in the next town over, Haddon Township. And that means that while the neighboring pubs down the street in Haddon Township have been able to use their entire parking lots for outdoor dining and pub service, this one could only use the handful of spaces between the building and the street. It's things like that that led to our occasional red tape follies reports on strange but true bureaucratic nightmares that whiskey makers and retailers deal with routinely. and the new book by Jarrett Dieterle of the R Street Institute Think Tank in Washington, D.C. Give Me Liberty and Give Me a Drink is being published on September 15th. I talked with Jarrett this week via StreamYard. Beverage alcohol is probably one of the most regulated consumer products in the world, isn't it? Yep, it is. It's got to be up there. Probably any, any top three list it would be in. And that, of course, leads to some fairly uh, crazy regulations and laws, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Uh, especially here in the United States, we we probably more than any other industry, the alcohol industry has some tremendously weird, bizarre, quirky laws. Um, really, in every state, it it uh, doesn't discriminate on geography or uh, red state, blue state, or anything like that. Every everyone's got uh, some pretty bizarre laws, which which are really a a feature of our history and, and because of our history, our, our prohibition history, and then our, our post-prohibition history. Let's go into that because, as you note, a lot of this comes out of prohibition, right? Explain how we got to this point. Well, uh, uh, prohibition, obviously, everyone listening to this podcast knows uh, very well uh, what that was. Um, it, it was a, a monumental uh, moment in our country's history. But I think what a lot of people don't realize is, uh, you know, nerdy booze enthusiasts like me go out on December 5th every year on repeal day and, and raise our, our glasses uh, at the bar back when we could go to bars uh, and, and kind of celebrate repeal day. Um, but but really, when repeal day happened, it, it basically meant that the federal government got out of the business of regulating alcohol and there was kind of this void and into the void step states and local governments. And the sentiment, the the temperance sentiment and, and some of the anti-alcohol sentiment of the era didn't just vanish overnight once prohibition was gone. Everyone agreed that was a failure, but it didn't just go away. And so what was next and what came next was uh, a, a concerted effort by a lot of uh, temperance forces at the time to try to enact uh, controls, what they called it, uh, at the state level of, of alcohol. And that could be everything from there's dry states uh, after prohibition all the way up until the 60s. It could be things like control states where the government acts as the wholesaler and retailer of alcohol. Uh, it could be things like the three-tiered system and all, all different processes to try to control how we drink and how producers take their product from point A and get it to point B uh, as us consumers. So a lot of these weird laws we see derived from that and, and kind of the licensing system that grew out of that. It's why we have uh, government-controlled uh, alcohol stores. It's why we have weird, quirky things like uh, in Indiana – uh, gas stations there can uh, sell beer, but they can't sell it cold. Only liquor stores can do that. And, and it's an example of just this weird licensing quirk that grew out of this system that tried to separate and regiment and control uh, alcohol and, and how we drink it. And let's be fair, they did this at the retail level and where we consumers interact with alcohol because uh, the federal government still regulates alcohol. They just regulate the production of it. Along yeah. with the states. Yeah, that, that's a good clarification that gets lost in this a lot. I mean, the federal government does uh, still play a role. They didn't just totally 
give up everything. But but yeah, it was mostly the the sale of alcohol is what kind of uh, uh, became a lower uh, lower level of government issue. I mean, labeling issues obviously are still very much a, a federal issue. A lot of tax uh, implications are still at the federal level for producers. Um, and states regulate producers too, of course. Uh, but yeah, you're right. So it's become a in, in a lot of ways even more fragmented system now because you have three layers of government that are regulating alcohol. You mentioned the uh, the legendary Indiana cold beer law. Having grown up in Indiana, I was there during the time when liquor stores were closed on Sundays and you couldn't even get a beer at a restaurant. I was in college before they finally even allowed you to have a drink at a Sunday dinner for crying out loud. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's funny. Indiana's uh, had kind of this recent uh, effort uh, over the last couple of years to update some of their retailing rules. Uh, and the big one was was the Sunday sales. Um, and, and I referenced it earlier. But actually, originally, convenience stores, gas stations, they weren't really allowed to sell beer and wine at all. Uh, eventually, you know, they they pushed and were able to change that. And then now they can sell wine. They can sell cold wine. They can sell beer. They can't sell cold beer. And so, yeah, they've kind of gradually tried to update that over time. But but the last hurdle is is this bizarre law that you can have beer in your store, but you can't plop it in the refrigerator. And it was funny at one gas station owner figured out that if he started selling uh, burritos and installed a couple tables in, in his uh, convenience store, that he'd get a restaurant permit, a uh, different type of license. And then, boom, all of a sudden he could sell cold beer. But but the government didn't like that uh, work around one bit and uh, told him that that had to go. So, yeah, it, it, it's kind of the last uh, hill or frontier for, for a lot of the retail stores in Indiana is to get that law uh, into the dustbin of history. But really no other state has something like that, of course. But they all have their own unique laws. Texas, for instance, doesn't allow publicly traded companies to have a liquor license like yep. Walmart, which is fighting it in the federal courts right now. Yeah, that's absolutely right. That rule really originated with Texas's uh infamous uh, consanguinity uh, exception, which w basically in Texas, there's a rule that you uh, can't own more than five liquor stores. Originally, there was a rule uh, at one time. There was an exception, though, if it was a, a blood relative of yours. So I kind of set up this system where, you know, cousin Jimmy might own five stores and then Uncle Vin might own five stores and uh, I might be their uh, their cousin and own another five stores. Uh, and, and that eventually got repealed. But uh, what remained, uh, they kind of realized that a lot of the stuff they're trying to accomplish with that law could be accomplished by just trying to uh, prophylactically ban basically public companies from uh, being in the states. And, and as you said, that that's being challenged. Actually, uh, they're trying to get the Supreme Court to hear the case. We'll, we'll, we'll see where that goes. But but yes, uh, Texas's uh, uh, liquor store rules are another famous example. One of the questions I get a lot is, how did the three tier system come into being in the first place? And obviously that comes out of prohibition because before prohibition, we had a lot of breweries that owned pubs and were doing their own retailing. As you noted, the temperance forces wanted to try to separate the producers of alcohol from the retailers. How yep. did we wind up with a three tier system enshrined in 51 different states and the District of Columbia without any federal regulation over this? because of the interstate commerce part of the constitution, which drives everybody nuts. Yep. No, you, you hit on a, a couple excellent points there. Yeah. It, the, the idea behind it was, was to prevent what are, uh, were known at the time as tied houses, whereas you referenced the, the brewer or distiller would own all the saloons and pubs in town and they would only serve their own products. <laughs> so it was kind of a, a, mon a monopoly basically is what, what the concern was, uh, geographical monopolies in areas. Uh, and then so that's why they wanted to insert these different tiers that made sure that no one could own multiple tiers in, in the link. And so they inserted the wholesaler level to provide an additional buffer uh, there um, and and, and uh, kind of try to help the little guy kind of get a foothold in, in the market. Um, it is interesting today that the way things have changed, it's such a different marketplace now than, than obviously it was at that time. Uh, after Prohibition really was only the big uh, producers that survived it. They were the only ones that had the money to make soda or something for a decade and a half and then and then get back into alcohol. But now in the midst of this craft spirits boom, and it, it's interesting because a lot of the uh, little producers sometimes feel like it's tough for them now to get attention from the uh, wholesalers and, and, and from the retailers uh, because they prioritize, of course, the products that are the biggest sellers, kind of the flagship things that are selling well. So it's interesting how that's kind of 
changed over time. And uh, then as you also referenced it, there's been somewhat of a, a movement to allow direct to consumer shipping of, of products, which would allow kind of really small micro producers to be able to just ship a, a product. You know, if I have a brewery that I really love in my home state of Michigan, which I have several, I could theoretically uh, get it delivered directly to me uh, in Virginia, where I reside now near Richmond. Um, and they may they may not be big enough to kind of enter the the national wholesaling market, but but they maybe could do that. And and what prevents that is, as you mentioned, is is uh, well, or at least what some people feel prevents that is, is the Constitution and this uh, debate over whether that's something that should be protected under the Commerce Clause and that, and that should be allowed state to state shipment like that, uh, or whether it's something that states can prohibit under under the Twenty First Amendment, which is what got rid of uh, prohibition. And let's explain the 21st Amendment gave the states the right to control alcohol within their state. Yep. And the lawyers, at least the judges that have interpreted this in cases like Granholm and things, have basically ruled that that supersedes the Commerce Clause because it was enacted after the Commerce Clause in the original Constitution, right? Yeah, well, so it's interesting. Uh, in in the uh, Granholm case, uh, that was 2005, uh, that involved a uh, a Michigan uh, system that uh, that allowed in-state wineries to ship their wine directly to consumers in Michigan, but wouldn't allow out-of-state ones to do it. The court did strike that down. They said that they could not uh, discriminate against uh, out-of-state wineries. Um, subsequent courts came in and narrowed that and said, well, that just applies to wineries. It doesn't apply to necessarily to breweries or distilleries. It doesn't apply to retail stores that want to ship uh, you know, across state, state lines. Um, and then fast forward to uh, last year when the uh, Supreme Court heard uh, another case, a Tennessee wine case. It didn't involve uh, shipping per se, but it involved a Tennessee rule. Uh, Again, another bizarre rule where it said that in order to own a liquor store in Tennessee, you effectively uh, had to be a resident there for for 10 years. Um, They wanted people that were were in-state residents to to be preferenced opening stores. And, And the court again stepped in and said, you know, look, yes, the 21st Amendment gives states a lot of power, but not that. They can't uh, economically discriminate against out-of-state residents and, and struck that down. There's some very broad language in that opinion that some legal experts thought might apply to some of these shipping issues. Um, but once again, we've seen lower courts. Uh, there, there's a, another case uh, in, the, in the Sixth Circuit, again, involving Michigan. Uh, in this case, it's an out-of-state retailer trying to ship into Michigan, not a winery or not a producer. Uh, and and the, the Sixth Circuit said that, yeah, we've read Granholm. Yeah, we've read the Tennessee wine case, but we still feel like the retailers are different. And so that's going to be kind of the next frontier here that's going to, again, maybe make its way someday to the, to the Supreme Court. We'll, we'll see. Then, of course, it is the only thing that keeps Amazon from just running all the local liquor stores out of business and taking over the entire thing. Sure. And, and then that's uh, obviously one of the the arguments that a lot of people are, are advancing. It's one of the things that worries a lot of people just, just really generally in this debate. It, it, everyone loves kind of the um, craft producers. Uh, obviously, we all we all have ones that we love. Everyone loves the the local uh, store that 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 you know they've gone to for for a long time. And so, I think everyone kind of has an interest in in how to um, keep that uh, that fun and, and fragmented nature of our alcohol markets. And it's kind of just figuring out how to how to do that um, and and whether kind of these rules from from decades and decades ago are, are really the best way to do that, or um, if uh, more of an open market might might actually help help do that. But but yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. I think everyone has has the same goals, but uh, maybe not always the same means for accomplishing it. And one of those goals is to maintain your segment of the business, which is why the three tiers often are pitted against each other. And the craft distillers are pitted against all of them because they want to break into this existing, really not a free market. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, everyone obviously has a business model that's been uh, kind of just uh, etched in amber now for uh, 85 years after prohibition. And obviously, they don't want that to go away. And, and it's kind of these upstart entrepreneurial spirits and uh, beer maker and winemakers that are trying to figure out how to how to get a toehold into this market and, and where they can go. And so I think a lot of them really do have an interest, as I referenced earlier, to be able to access uh, these very narrow but very deep and passionate customer bases across the country. Um, you know, uh, booze enthusiasts like us, you know, we will, we will go to a distillery uh, in a different state and we will try their whiskey and we will uh, say, we really like that. And we want five bottles of that. You know, we're not the average consumer necessarily, but we're a very passionate uh, consumer base. And so I think it's just those, those small guys want to be able to figure out how to access 
uh, that that market, which they can't really right now very very well. And so that that, that that's what makes it. Uh, I think that's what makes it uh, tough for them, and especially in this environment of. Uh, of COVID-19. We can't ignore that. Of course, things like, you know, tap rooms and tasting rooms, a lot of the way that they advertise was word of mouth and, and was having people come in and, and making those purchases on site. And that, that by and large has gone away. I mean, some of them are now able to do modified, op- you know, limited capacity openings, but it's much different than, than what it was. And it's been interesting. Some of the states that have waived kind of uh, intrastate within the state shipment, uh, they obviously can't necessarily always do it outside of the state, but have allowed distillers to start shipping for example in virginia distillers can now ship to virginia residents and the craft distillers here love it they're saying that it's like you know a tuesday is now the equivalent of a saturday <laughs> because they can ship out a bunch of uh, bottles of whiskey and uh, you know people wouldn't have necessarily got it beforehand if they, if they lived uh, three or four hours away from the distillery so uh, it, it's going to be changing times i think for how some of these laws evolve given given the pandemic too and once you get something it's hard to take it away which means I think we're going to see these laws or these changes become permanent because uh, once you get used to it, it's hard to take back something that these that the distillers have been given. Yeah, it's absolutely right. It, it's interesting. The million dollar question is how many will be made permanent. So much of the stuff is is existing, obviously temporarily under these emergency uh, orders by by governors. Uh, but but you're right. You know, so for Virginia, for example, again to just to to borrow them because because I'm I'm here as a, as a resident. They've temporarily granted this shipping privilege to the in state distillers. But you're right. It's going to be hard to get rid of that. It, it is funny. This this modern. Uh, um, have everything at your fingertips uh, society of consumers that we have, you know, once they get something like that, it's going to be hard to take it away. We, I like to tell people that you can pretty much have every product under the sun shipped to your door within uh, two days and sometimes within two hours. Um, but, but there's kind of this, this exception in a lot of places and, and not everywhere, but in a lot of places in America that you can, that that's with alcohol, it's with spirits, it's with beer. Um, but, but you're right. The more I think people taste that, it's going to be hard to put that toothpaste back into the, the tube. Is our regulatory climate and our laws in the various states, are those any crazier than what we see in other countries that regulate it's, at the national level? It's interesting. Yeah, I get asked this question all the time. Um, I, I've obviously studied much less uh, Europe and, and other places, uh, alcohol laws, but it's interesting. It, it um, People, everyone kind of likes to complain about their laws, I've realized, when I've talked to, to people that live in uh, other places, um, whether it's uh, a, a brewer from Mexico or, or someone uh, in, in Europe, um, uh, because I think that's what they live with every day. Europe obviously has... Um, uh, oftentimes, uh, higher tax rates um, and higher compliance burdens, I think, than uh, some of some of what you see in, in the U.S. market. Um, but but they don't necessarily have uh, kind of this history that we have, and then exactly uh, a three tiered system set up exactly like we do. Um, so so it's very different, and I think hard to compare it. Um, but but I I think that it's universal uh, uh, thing that I've noticed from from uh, uh, producers of alcohol where I talk to that there's there's definitely uh, ways in which they think that that the uh, way the government touches their product could be made more efficient uh, at, at the very least. They're they're not against. Uh, I think it's important. They're they're not just what they don't want anarchy, right? They understand that alcohol is something that that will and needs to be regulated. But I think that they universally feel like. Uh, Maybe it could be in a little more uh, collaborative uh, way, um, a little bit more working together than uh, uh, sometimes where it will be a little bit more uh, uh, kind of you know, slap on the wrist or gotcha type mentality. So, yeah, it, it, it's, it's really hard to compare, but I think that every, every place has uh, ways in which they can make their laws more efficient. So let's go through some of the inefficient ones now that you've written about in this book. Besides the Indiana cold beer and the convenience store rules and the Texas consanguinity regulations, what else do we look at around the country and just go, who was thinking this was a good idea? Yeah, there, there's so much to choose from. Uh, one one that's fun and is election themed since we're approaching an election year. Uh, Alaska has a rule that you uh, that places can't sell alcohol on uh, election day. There, it goes back to a time when actually a lot of time the voting booths were in saloons. <laughs> that's where people went because that was the biggest place in town, and so they didn't want alcohol to be in the polling stations, which you know can make some sense. Uh, but but it's still on, on the books today, um, and uh, 
uh, is a not, number of not, states have that though. They do, yes, right. You see a lot of similarities uh, across states. I, in an effort to try to feature one from each state, uh, I wasn't able to uh, oftentimes repeat uh, or feature the repeat offenders, uh, if you will. But yes, that's something you see. You see, of course, still uh, variants of blue laws on, on Sundays across the country. Um, oftentimes now it's kind of an hour restriction or a, a certain type of spirit is, is targeted that, that they can't sell. Um, although uh, the so-called brunch bills are becoming more popular, which are, which are trying to uh, repeal a lot of those. Um, you know, you see uh, a lot of labeling laws, uh, whether it's at the TTB, the federal government that regulates really kind of detailed things like any anything and like i mean anything that could be construed as a health claim you know can't go on it there was a a famous case of, of king of hearts beer a couple of years ago and the ttb was was very worried that the people might take that beer and say well this might help my heart <laughs> which i think is a little bit of a stretch but you have to be uh, very very careful about uh about stuff like that. And a lot of states have, have similar rules too. Um, the, the labeling issue can be both a, a state and, and federal uh, issue. Um, but yeah, there, there's just a, a whole, and then, and then there's a lot of restaurant rules too, and, and happy hour rules. Uh, Massachusetts uh, infamously uh, bans a happy hour outright. Uh, North Carolina, you can have happy hour, but only for food. You only have discounts on the food, not on the drinks. Uh, Washington state is, is another fun one that uh, hurts small distillers there. They have a, a rule where you only can uh, sample up to two ounces in their tasting rooms of the beverage when you're there. Um, even though you can go to the brewery down the street and gulp, you know, uh, a really uh, high ABV IPAs like like they're going out of style. And of course, there's still laws against over serving there, but but they target distilleries in that way. Um, so yeah, there there is uh, no shortage of, of things that are just head scratching laws that will make you go, what? Like I, I did, could not imagine we would still have a law in the books like that. How many states do we have? I know New York has been notorious for rejecting labels that the TTB has approved on some spirits where they've gone back and said, no, we're not signing off on that. You can't sell that in New York state. Right. But there are other states that enforce their own labeling restrictions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Michigan's a famous one. They've uh, had a couple high profile cases. They've actually turned into First Amendment uh, cases and they ended up losing, um, saying that uh, – uh, a label was detrimental to the health and, and welfare of, of the state. Um, and uh, because it had maybe had like a, a word they didn't like on it or something they deemed as an offensive word or, or caricature or image on, on the label. Um, and, and, but you're right. Some States will take the federal approval and they will deem that enough to make it okay for that state. Um, and you don't need to do anything else, but then there's others, you know, New York, Michigan that will go above and beyond kind of, and have an, uh, you have to additionally go through their, their layer. Of, of clearance to to get approved. Uh, North Carolina is another one that's had a, a couple scrapes uh, with uh, in Arkansas uh, as well that that, that that have had some scrapes with producers that have had labels that they deem offensive or inappropriate in some way. And South Carolina had one of the more infamous rules until a few years ago where bars could only pour drinks out of airline-sized bottles, the little 50 ml bottles. And they can only <laughs> stock those for cocktails. They couldn't pour from a full-size bottle. Yeah, the whole history of how mini bottles are regulated is hilarious. Wayne Curtis wrote a really funny article for Imbibe about it uh, three or four years back. Um, but it's funny, all, all different states can't really decide how to how to handle them. I mean, there's been ones that, uh, and I can't remember all the names right now, but there's been ones that have, you know, said that, well, little bottles are good because there's less alcohol in them. And so, you know, that that's better than having big bottles of alcohol for people. And then there's been other states that have said, well, they're easier to conceal. So it's going to promote more people drinking, uh, you know, versus the big bottles. And then, of course, there's South Carolina that <laughs> actually mandated that, uh, that, 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 that they actually make cocktails with it. Mini bottles have a long history and no one can decide what to do with them, whether they like them or not, or they're good or they're bad. And there are some states, I know when I lived in Alaska, the uh, municipality of Anchorage at one point was restricting the sale of minis at some stores because the homeless population or street inebriates were buying those because that's what they could afford. And they figured that if they restricted the sale of those, they'd be able to keep uh, inebriates off the streets. And of course, yes. that really didn't work at all. Yep. But. No, you're, you're exactly right. Yeah, that that uh, a lot of states have taken that angle. Uh, but then there's been others that thought that the best way to kind of help prevent uh, inebriation is that, you know, the smaller bottles are a less amount of, of liquor, I guess, than the bigger bottles. So I don't know if that makes logical sense or not, but but that's been their, their uh, <laughs> way they looked at it. So yeah, mini, mini bottles uh, are, are kind of the special category that's had a lot of 
bizarre things. New Orleans has a a, a rule that on uh, airplanes um, that they can be uh, a larger size mini bottle, but the traditional ones we're all used to. Um, technically, you're not supposed to have in New Orleans, um, and and uh, the ones we see on airplanes and stuff like that, you're you're not supposed to uh, have there. It was actually funny in my book. I uh, Chris Hanna, the the legendary uh, bartender down there, he helped me uh, batch up uh, the cocktail that could be uh, done in mini bottles if you wanted to bring it on your plane for for that law. So it was a, a fun way to have it inspired by uh, by that New Orleans law. But yeah, mini bottles are a category unto their own when it comes to regulation. This is a question I don't think we've ever addressed. I know we've never addressed it on Whiskey Cast. Who regulates the airplanes and the airline industry? Is it the yeah. state where the plane takes off from? Is it the state where they land? Who regulates the airlines? My understanding, uh, and I have not exhaustively looked into this subcategory of regulation in the airspace, but my understanding is that it is regulated at the federal level. They obviously have preemptive uh, power over stuff. It would be a uh, a nightmare, I guess, if a plane landed in a different state that had different rules and they had to comply with all that. So my understanding is, is that that's how it goes. It's interesting. Speaking of transportation, of course, and prohibition, famously, there was the 12 mile limit on the shoreline. Um, and beyond that was considered international waters. So all the rum running ships would just anchor there to uh, be outside of the jurisdiction of the U.S. Um, and then make smaller boats do their runs uh, in there. And obviously there's uh, the famous 12 mile limit drink that was uh, inspired after that. But but yeah, people have been using transportation to uh, to get around alcohol rules for for a long time. So what are some of the other cocktails in the book? Because you have a cocktail for each state, if I remember correctly. That's exactly right. There's a, a lot of fun cocktails. We do everything from, you know, the classics like the Negroni and, and the Old Fashioned in Manhattan uh, to more, you know, fancy things. Um, we have a, a spiced up uh, mezcalita recipe, for example. There's some pitcher drinks for things like Bloody Marys, uh, winter seasonal drinks like uh, uh, different kinds of eggnogs. You know, a lot of them are, are classics that I really... Uh, uh, grew up uh, caring a lot about the the classics and kind of uh, learned what cocktails were and how to make them when when I was uh, first getting into to spirits uh, through the classics and then I have a couple of spins on it uh, for fun just to change things up and and, and as I said I try to uh, oftentimes make uh, the the cocktail be somehow inspired by the uh, the law that I'm writing about so Washington State for example. Uh, the drink in that one, instead of having two ounces of spirits, has 1.99999 because the distilleries there are limited to uh, under two ounces when they uh, serve you at, <laughs> at, uh, at their tap room. So we try to have fun with it and uh, just, you know, raise raise a little bit of uh, uh, interest and awareness and in, in some of the quirky stuff that, that's going on out there. And it can only hopefully get better. <laughs> that's the hope. Yes. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting. As I said, it's been such an ossified area of the legal world. Um, but, but yeah, it, it'll be really interesting how, uh, the current pandemic, uh, maybe changes some of that going forward. It already has, and, and we'll see what, what out of that lasts. And we also have this new era of prohibition that people keep talking about where people are actually using the pandemic and other things as a way to restrict alcohol sales. Look at yeah. what Pennsylvania did when they locked down the entire state liquor store system in a control state, except for the craft distilleries that were allowed to sell their stuff, which was great for them. But unless you lived near a craft distillery, you were kind of hosed. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, it's funny. We, we kind of, keep to keep needing to relearn this lesson that when you um, you know, whether you like it or not, and everyone gets in this debate about whether liquor stores are essential or not essential. And in some ways I feel like that's immaterial because human history has taught us that people will want alcohol, they enjoy it um, and they will find a way to get it and access it. And uh, when you raise the barriers so high that you can't get it legally, unfortunately people will, turn to more risky ways of doing it during prohibition itself. Of course, the, the prolific black market um, and, and bootlegging arose. But in, in Pennsylvania, when, when they shut down the state liquor stores, they either, as you said, had to go to a distillery or, or what was happening very often is people going across state borders in New Jersey, West Virginia, and all the bordering states and flooding the, the liquor stores that were open in those states. And that made social distancing impossible. A couple of them, unfortunately, had to like temporarily just like close because they were so overwhelmed by the crush of people that were coming in there. Um, um, and, and Mexico, uh, 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 for its part, to, to uh, use an example of another country, uh, temporarily halted brewing there. And, um, you know, when, when that happens, it, 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 which actually did happen in, in Mexico, it uh, leads Same to thing uh, in South Africa, where they yep. shut down the entire spirits and wine industry. Yep, exactly. Twice. Yep. 
Yep. And, and then especially in those uh, less developed countries, oftentimes that that will still lead to a black market where people are making moonshine and illegal illicit alcohol. And unfortunately, that's not often not a safe. And so I, I see stories almost every week of, uh, you know, entire villages that were poisoned by uh, bad alcohol and a real tragedy. Um, and, and so it really it's kind of counter to to helping public health really when when you totally close it off i think a better framework for it for for government regulators is to know that it's going to exist and find ways to create safe legal access to it for people um instead of getting bogged down in this debate of whether it's essential or not it doesn't matter whether it's essential it's going to happen jarrett Dieterle's book give me liberty and give me a drink will be published on september 15th and is available for pre-orders now there's also a virtual launch party that evening online with Jarrett and Christine Riggleman of Virginia's Silverback Distillery. We've included a link for more details in the show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. Jarrett is also launching a five-episode podcast series on alcohol laws as well. That also starts on September 15th. The Right to Drink will be available wherever you get your podcasts. One final note, that question during our conversation on how airline alcohol sales are regulated, I'm checking on that now. I hope to have the answer on an upcoming episode in our Behind the Label segment. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret. Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskeys, comes a single malt inspired by an original. For a fortunate few, discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's start off with a couple of new releases in the McAllen's Double Cask series, which started off in 2016 with the Double Cask 12-year-old, matured in both American and European oak. The McAllen Double Cask 15-year-old is bottled at 43% ABV. The nose has very delicate and complex notes of dried apricots and apple chips, a hint of oak, toffee, honey, and cocoa powder. The taste balances raisins, orange peel, butterscotch, and a good oakiness with ginger and other baking spices, vanilla, and a touch of tropical fruits in the background. The finish is creamy and soothing with a lingering touch of ginger, tropical fruits, caramel, and just a hint of vanilla. I'm scoring the McAllen Double Cask 15-year-old a 93. The 18-year-old version is also bottled at 43% ABV and has a gentle touch of fruit on the nose with peaches, pears, and apples balanced by a touch of orange peel subtle spices, and a hint of toffee. The taste has a creamy mouthfeel at first, followed by a nice bite of oak tannins, while raisins and orange peel complement touches of crystallized ginger and butterscotch. The finish, warm and gentle, with hints of mandarin oranges and oak, along with a gingery character that lasts long after the other flavors have faded away. I'm scoring the McAllen Double Cask 18-year-old a 95. More tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey, which will be releasing the next batch of Penny's Proof later this year. It's a preview of Sagamore Spirit Whiskey distilled on-site in Baltimore. Last year's first release of samples sold out in hours. The only way to find out when and how to get your hands on this year's batch is to join Sagamore Spirit's Whiskey Thieves. You can sign up today at sagamorespirit.com. Great Drams, the independent bottling team of Kirsty and Greg Dillon, recently released a rare single cask bottling of a 30-year-old Gervin single-grain whiskey distilled in 1989. I received a sample of it this week. It's bottled at 54.5% ABV. The nose has notes of candied orange slices, fresh berries, vanilla beans, and dried flowers. The taste is fruity with orange marmalade, fresh berries, 
subtle touches of ginger, allspice, and vanilla, and a nice oakiness that comes forward on the finish, which is good and long with lingering fruits and spicy notes. Single grains have always been a bit underrated among Scotch whiskies. This one's a good one. I'm scoring the Great Dram's Gervin 30-year-old single cask a 94. Oregon's Rogue Ales and Spirits has been working with the original Iron Chef, Masaharu Morimoto, for many years now, and the two have collaborated on a unique American single malt whiskey. Rogue's Morimoto single malt was distilled back in 2016 from the mashes for their Morimoto Imperial Pilsner beer and Morimoto Black Oak Ale beer. The whiskey was then matured in American oak for two years. After that, it was filled into casks that had previously held Rogue's Rolling Thunder Imperial Stout to spend another 18 months. It's bottled at 42.5% ABV, the nose is dry and oaky with subtle spices and hints of cocoa beans, espresso, and dried apples. The taste is nutty with smoked almonds, cocoa beans, toffee, and a hint of creme brulee. The finish is long and smoky with freshly roasted coffee beans and dark chocolate. I'm scoring Rogue's Morimoto Single Malt a 90. And finally, let's look at Art Begg's second release of Trayvon. It's 19-year-old single malt that made its debut last year as an annual release. Batch 2 is bottled at 46.2% ABV, just like last year's, but uses a higher percentage of first fill ex-bourbon casks in the mix, along with refill and ex-sherry casks. The nose is smoky with grilled fruits, heather, black tea, and lemon, a touch of brine, and a hint of eucalyptus cough drops. The taste is briny, tart, and slightly medicinal with grilled pineapple, peat smoke, pine needles, heather, and a hint of lemon zest. The finish is long and slightly tart with a gentle smokiness. I'm scoring Art Begg's Batch 2 of Trayvon a 93. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,900 different whiskeys from around the world. You can check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. It's time to announce September's Whiskey Club of the Month. This month, we're honoring the Old Town Whiskey Club of Manassas, Virginia. Gregory Cook is one of the founders and emailed us to nominate his club, it's only a year old, but already has 65 members and does regular tastings and tours of local distilleries. If you're in northern Virginia and the D.C. suburbs, we've added a link to their website on the Whiskey Clubs page at whiskeycast.com. Congratulations to the Old Town Whiskey Club. We'll be sending you two dozen Whiskey Cast Glen Cairn glasses to use at your upcoming socially distanced club tastings. If you're a member of a whiskey club and want to nominate your group for Whiskey Club of the Month honors, all you have to do is use the contact form at whiskeycast.com, tell us a bit about your club, and if your club has a website or a social media presence, we'll be glad to add a link on the Whiskey Clubs page at our website. We pick a winner on the first episode each month, and if you've already emailed us in the past, you don't have to enter again we do roll over the nominations from month to month. Once again, congratulations to the Old Town Whiskey Club of Manassas, Virginia, September's Whiskey Club of the Month, and thanks to Glencairn Crystal for helping us honor whiskey clubs around the world. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. Benjamin Reed at Ranger Rick on Twitter had this comment about last week's interview with forestry scientist Tom Kimmerer. I love this phrase from Tom Kimmerer on the latest whiskey cast. Bourbon is essentially white oak extract. Well, if you want to know what Tom meant by that, listen to the in-depth interview in last week's show. The other day, our pal Maggie Kimbrell at LouGirl502 tweeted from Louisville, there's no crying in whiskey. Like hell there isn't. You ever drop a full bottle and have it break on you? 
Tess at Tess 070770 tweeted, Lost my last bottle from the old Tamdu distillery that way. Fifteen years later, still had a crying emoji in there. But John O'Donovan at Cole OD USMC, I suspect that means he's a retired Marine colonel, tweeted, I hate it when I get glass in my tongue from licking it up. Yeah, John, I want to see video of that. And when I tweeted out Wednesday morning that the Glenlivet plans to make its edible cocktail capsules available globally in the coming months, at Mark S. Brownstein responded, as if 2020 couldn't get any worse. No, Mark, that would only be if someone put fireball into those edible capsules. If you have a question, suggestion, or anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find us on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label our look at the history, science, and all those other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. Last time around, we reported on this year's Four Roses Limited Edition Small Batch Bourbon, which is coming out this month. It includes four of the distillery's ten different recipes, a 12-year-old OESV and a 12-year-old OESK whiskey, a 16-year-old OESK, and a 19-year-old OBSK. Now, if you're not a longtime Four Roses fan, that sounds a lot like gibberish. And Four Roses is the only distillery that does things this way. It all goes back to the days when Seagram's owned the place, as master distiller Brent Elliott explained during his Zoom call with reporters last week. The way we produce 10 different recipes at our distillery in Lawrenceburg is we start out with two different mash bills. And you can see here on this infographic, we've got the mash bill B at the top, which is 60% corn, 35% rye, and 5% malted barley. And then below it is the mash bill E, that's the lower rye mash bill, which is still relatively high in rye compared to most other bourbons. It's 75% corn, 20% rye, and 5% malted barley. And then we have, on top of those two mash bills, we ferment, with one of five different yeast strains. Uh, we have our V yeast on the far left. It creates a delicate fruity flavor through the fermentation. The K, which creates slight spicy flavors and aromas. The O, which is rich and fruity. The Q, which creates floral aromas and flavors. And the F, which is herbal, somewhat minty. And you'll notice it's a four letter code here. So one, for example, the OBSV. The O is a throwback to the Seagram's days when they had more than one distillery in Kentucky. So the O designated the Old Prentice Distillery, which was the original name of the current Four Roses Distillery. Now that's the only distillery that remains of those original distilleries. So that's the only letter you'll ever see associated with Four Roses for the first letter, and it's the only letter we use. Second, that designates the mash bill, as I explained. The third is straight bourbon whiskey. That doesn't change. That is the only thing we make at Four Roses. And the last letter is the yeast strain. So you want to look at the, the second letter and the fourth letter. Most distilleries rarely use more than one strain of yeast regularly, let alone maintain five different ones. Later in the call, I asked Brent whether they have ever retired yeast strains in the past. I know Seagram's had a library of 300 to 400 different yeast strains that were used uh, in various products uh, specific to Four Roses Bourbon, I know this one is always utilized um, with up to all five um, of the different yeast strains. So certainly there were yeast strains that were probably tried out and used for some of the other products, um, other spirits that they produced. But to my knowledge, of these, these five, this has pretty much been the core five that we've utilized going pretty far back, going as far back as as I've heard. Thanks to Brett Elliott of Four Roses for the explanations. And here's a bonus explainer. How did yeast get its name? If you've ever visited a distillery and watched an open-top fermenter bubbling away as the yeast does its work, 
that is part of the origin. Matt Bachman is an associate professor of biochemistry at Indiana University, my alma mater, and he explained it this way the other night during a webinar. The English word yeast comes from the Dutch word yeast, which is derived from the Greek word for boiling. And getting the gist of something literally means boiling it down. We've had requests to do more in-depth on yeast and fermentation, along the lines of what we did with Oak last week and on the recent webcast with Tom Kimmerer. I am working with Matt Bachman to find a time when we can talk. In the meantime, if you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, an 18th century style of premium Irish whiskey, blended from single pot still and single malt. Like yourself, it's one of life's treasured rarities, and what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, our whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. We'd love to hear from you. You can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2020, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.